Lewis Castle, welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Thank you. It's an it's honor to, to have here. you. Oh my gosh, it's rare to have a, a legend from the game industry. So thanks for <laughs> joining us, man. And you're giving a talk at GDC this year, so you officially reach legendary status, I think. <laughs> well, I've given talks at GDC before on products I've worked on. Um, the, I'm on the board, and we talk every year about uh, classic postmortems. And every year, it seems we come up with uh, Command & Conquer. It's a bit tough because there's so many people that worked on Command & Conquer, and they're kind of uh, separated all over. So uh, this year, I finally said, okay, I have an idea on how to do this. Uh, what I'm going to do is interview all these folks, uh, as many as I can, on video and audio, and then put together a compilation and have a few on stage. So it's a, a bit of a party. Um, it's going to be fun. It's a, it's a neat uh, neat forum and a different a different kind of approach to a classic postmortem. So it should be a lot of fun to come see. Yeah, it's nice that uh, you'd have that approach. I think, you know, not that other developers are selfish out there, but I could see a lot of other developers being like, you know what? You know, I was pretty high up in that company. I'm just going to go ahead and talk about Command & Conquer by myself. Why do you feel like it's important to rope everybody in? You know, for Command & Conquer especially, I thought it was really important. First of all, it wasn't a huge team. It was a small number of people. Um, but second of all, it, you know, the game really did come about by um, so many con contributions from so many different people. And there were some really interesting things about Command & Conquer that um, were sort of firsts. Uh, maybe not the first person to do cutscenes, but one of the very first to do them on CD-ROM, where you have full screen video and audio. And so having an actual director uh, who is Joe Kukin, uh, that's a very big part of the game. And although the game strategy and design was very important, you know, the vision around the story, uh, Brett, obviously the the uh, the key person who drove that project uh, from start to finish as the executive producer. So I have a lot of Brett um, on interview, but there's great contributions from Maria who did all the install work and, uh, you know, the video work and people who played characters, lots of other stuff to, to play around with. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I wish I had more time because an hour, I have hours of uh, video and audio. So it's just crunching it all down is, is the hardest part. You should release that full extended cut. I think Man and Conquer fans really want to see just that weird oral history of the entire thing. Uh, if I can con my uh, my cousin into making all that, he's doing all the the kind of editing for me, and he's great at audio. That's what he does. But uh, but uh, we're not we're not video editors, so <laughs> we'll see. I think I think it's going to come out just fine. It's it's going to be very similar to Command and Conquer. It's going to be a bunch of people who don't know that they can't do this. So we're just going to do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> see how it goes. So what part of Command and Conquer were you most involved in, or were you most passionate about back in the day? Well, I was the uh, co-founder of the studio, and so by default, I because of my art background, I did have a lot to do with some of uh, the art direction and, and artwork, although I wasn't credited as the art director. And then I did some of the low-level code that we relied on for the um, compression and decompression. I was part of the video codec, and again, we had uh, some guys from university doing work on that too. So I contributed in a couple of different ways, technical and creative. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, just being part of operations for the company, I ran a lot of the stuff and helped to build our rendering farm and did some of our batch processing and things like that. So lots of little bits and pieces, uh, but not like I wasn't the head designer and I wasn't the head creative person. That's really Brett, uh, Joe Bostic, and, and a few yeah. other folks. So. Do you remember like the first meetings you had where the germ of an idea started to started to bubble up for Command & Conquer? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, you know, way back in the day, uh, we started with Dune 2, which was the first, what we would recognize as a modern RTS game. There were other games that had real-time and strategy, but they weren't really the resource, building units, sending them to war kind of um, idea. And then after that, uh, work, uh, Warcraft uh, followed us pretty closely, uh, both in, in the way that the game worked as well as... Um, you know, in timing. And so we were looking at both of those and uh, we had started off even before Warcraft chip with the idea of doing swords and sorcery for the next game. We weren't going to do another Dune game. And so we started talking about that and uh, Brett said, you know, I have this idea for this story and I think we can make it all work. Um, and he talks more about it at the show as well, um, about where he got the idea and, and kind of mulling it over in his time. And I, I remember distinctly deciding to move away from swords and sorcery, which is great because we would have had, um, you know, guys in armor fighting goblins, which would have been very, very close to Warcraft. So I'm glad we didn't do that. <laughs> Never would. Uh, and we yeah. chose to chose to go war, uh, you know, modern warfare or modern military, near near future military. Um, it was all for accessibility, and it uh, it ended up being end up being really great because it's a great, great great separation between the two franchises. Plus, I mean, that fan base. It's it's interesting just thinking about you guys making that decision back then, and then how that just ropes in a different type of fan. Like I imagine there's a lot of even like 
military enthusiasts that see like that first command and conquer and they're like, all right, well, now I got to get into this. Forget these war tables I have set aside in my living room. This is just my new jam. Whereas looking at an elf on a screen, yeah, not so much. Yeah, you know, and that is uh, definitely part of the discussion that was made. Um, it, you know, it had a lot to do with we wanted to have um, mechanical units. And so that's also kind of weird. Uh, you have to get into sort of goblin culture or whatever gnomes or, you know, you have to, you have to really stretch the fantasy world to start having mechanical stuff. Um, and I, you're right about the fans, the military fans. In fact, actually, one of the things that doesn't come up in the in the stories that I'm that I'm sharing, but it has come up multiple times. When we did the concept work, Aaron Powell did uh, such a great job on some of the concept art uh, that the military actually called us and said, hey, um, we're kind of concerned here. Some of the stuff you're concepting, where are you getting your information? And it was all out of like Soldier of Fortune magazine. It was all, you know, back then there was no internet really. I mean, there existed, but it didn't have the kind of um, imagery that it does now. So we were just uh, trying to get everything we could and make up what we must, we imagine the military must have. And it turns out we were pretty close. So they contacted us, they put us under disclosure and we started doing some concept work for the military as well for a very brief period of time. Uh, and just after Command and Conquer was released and then it just got to be too much of a hassle. So we, we went back to just sticking to the games. Was that fun? What was the like mood around that? Is it like, oh, we're doing our patriotic uh, duty or is it like, hey, is this kind of cool. weird? I, yeah, I mean, it was really cool because we got a chance to actually work with the real kind of uh, conceptualization such but it actually ended up being a little restrictive because we were you know command and conquer was hopping now uh, the second one red alert was uh, old it was uh, you know the technology of the world war ii era what if all of this technology existed so we took the same approach which was to say what if this technology existed instead of um instead of it, it, it failing so that's where te tesla comes in and, and all sorts of things like philadelphia uh, project right but um right. it turned out to be pretty restrictive for the tiberian series because you know we were starting to do some um expansion packs for command and conquer after we did gold you know we did covert operations and some others and uh, of course once you're disclosed by the military you can't share any of that stuff so we were like you know i don't think it's worth it you know we're making a little bit of money but it's not it, it's just not worth being just you know having to worry about what we're going to do so we just rather not know what they're up to and guess um and we were pretty good at guessing <laughs> what about just uh, the name very base level command and conquer uh, do you remember other options back in the day or where did that come from yeah, there was there was a lot of discussion around the name as well, um, and uh, you know there there was some folks at uh, Virgin Marketing. You know, I wish I could remember the name of the the individuals that came up with Command and Conquer. Um, it could have been Brett. I didn't ever ask him that question, but I think uh, my memory was that um, Virgin had come to us with that name, uh, and it might have been some multiple variations on that. And I remember um, you know Brett being really excited about C and C, and then the name of the game after that because. On the catalogs back then, this is going way back, you would have a buying catalogs that would go to retailers and things were listed alphabetically. So if we had CNC colon, we would be one of the top games listed. Um, that was actually pretty important. You, this whole category didn't exist. So, you know, the original forecast for Command and Conquer was uh, under 100,000 copies. Um, and, you know, the, the, the thought that a strategy game could sell millions of copies was just, it was unthinkable. There was no way. Uh, but did Dune 2 sell pretty well? Well, Dune 2 sold about 80,000 copies, um, and then we estimate was pirated at least a million times. Um, it wasn't well protected. Um, we did our best, but at the time, floppy, do floppy disk games were really easy to pirate because the technology had gotten to the point where you could transfer things online. The size of the games were so small, 1.4 megabytes is just not that big. Right. And so um, people were just ripping it off left and right. Uh, in fact, we knew from even the BBSs, we had more like confirmed fans than we sold copies. So, uh, you know, that's a small percentage of people that would actually be playing it. So, so we're pretty sure everybody just stole it. Okay, that era, <laughs> it's so bizarre thinking about like the importance of Virgin coming in. Do you guys feel like you would have made these games if it wasn't for Virgin or in the, in the history books? Can we say that Richard Branson is responsible for the RTS genre? <laughs> well, certainly not Richard. Uh, okay. I do love Richard, but he didn't have much to do with our operational day to day. Uh, I would say that there was a, uh, I mean, I, I'm, this sounds a little cheeky, but it's just the truth. I think it was a combination of um, Virgin growing a big company to publish and distribute a bunch of games and the other Virgin developers not shipping anything. So basically, we had this large infrastructure that was built by Virgin, some really talented people who did an amazing job. And I mean, honestly, if it wasn't for Virgin, the marketing and all the effort they put behind it, they really overspent on it 
because basically Command and Conquer and a couple other Westwood games were the only games they had to sell. Um, the other games slipped and missed dates again and again and again. And so every time our sister studios would miss a date, there would be a bunch of people with nothing to do. Um, so they said, well, what do we have to sell? We have this thing. Let's sell it. Uh, and then, of course, you know, by the time we had had our second or third trade show showing Command and Conquer, it was pretty clear that we had a hit on our hands. So the, the numbers were revised. I do remember two things that were, were killer. The first was under 100,000 copies. Lifetime sales was the first estimate. By the time we were just about to launch in 95, the first um, when we opened up pre-orders, the estimate at that time was, uh, I think, 200,000 copies, and we had 300,000 pre-orders. So we knew that the estimate was off. Um, and then that's when it got really exciting because suddenly um, all of Virgin got engaged. They did television advertising in, Europe, in the UK. Um, the German offices, Christian Glue and um, and uh, um, Martin Spies, uh, were were so. Uh, I mean, they're so supportive. Um, Germany was a big audience for us. In fact, actually, we sold as many copies in Germany as the United States in the beginning. Oh, wow. Ultimately, the US, ultimately, the U.S. surpassed it because just a bigger market. But in the beginning, we were kind of equally balanced between Germany and the U.S. I'm really fascinated by those early days and like what gets the ball rolling, especially when it comes to the creation of like a whole new genre, like the RTS that you guys basically invented. So thinking about like Dune and thinking about the importance of spice and like harvesting spice, is that a one-to-one? -one? Is it just because of the fiction of Dune that like harvesting and, you know, resources are a thing in RTS games? No, I, I yeah, I don't think... I don't think that harvesting is a thing just because of Dune. I think that um, the idea of uh, having an economy where you have to manage an economy and gather resourcing um, and then build a, a base or a place to defend yourself, the, the idea that you're trying to manage economic growth and a war machine while at the same time you're conducting war, I think that's kind of core to the juxtapositioning of planning and execution. Um, it could be a gold mine where guys are digging mines. It could be chopping down trees. Um, Dune happened to be the spice from right. um, um, Spice Malosh from Arrakis. Uh, Siberian, it was really because um, Brett's vision of this, uh, this inciting incident which disrupted the global balance uh, where there was this great resource that was suddenly available in, in random countries. And of course, the rush for the industrialized world to go and control it. Um, and Kane comes out of that with these, this uh, sort of uh, um, really a charismatic individual that's going to marshal all these troops and say, no, don't let them come take your Tiberium. They're just the evil West trying to impose their will upon you. I think that was the kind of stage of the world at the time. And so it led really well into it. And Tiberian has a kind of horrific eventual um, infestation, you know, contamination of the planet, actually ultimately terraforming, uh, was all part of the original story. So the harvesting became part of the, the bedrock of the foundation of the story. Right, right. And then, of course, Red Alert 2, uh, Red Alert and Red Alert 2, all the series of Red Alerts, we didn't have uh, Tiberium. That was, it was, uh, was pre-Tiberium, so it was... Uh, you know, oil and other resources. So, yeah. Do you think this year is a good year to do the kind of retrospective on Command and Conquer because the the remakes, the remasters, are, are in the pipeline here? Yeah. Um, so, uh, really oddly, some things just serendipitously happen. We had our offsite for our game developers conference. Simon asked me, "Hey, do you think we could get uh, Command and Conquer?" Postmortem. My same answer always is like, "Brett's very busy doing other things in his life. I don't think he'll come and do it." I did check with Brett. And then I said, you know what, I, I can do this. I can get him to come into a studio. I'll record him and make sure that the proper, you know, proper respect is given to the, the actual creative director for that. Uh, so, yeah, I said, yes, let's do it. And then shortly thereafter, my friends at Petroglyph said, hey, you know, we can finally talk about this, but we're going to do uh, a game. Uh, you know, we're going to do a remaster. I said, wow, that's really weird. Um, this was not this was not coordinated in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, all respects to EA. They own the franchise. Um, they get to do what they want to do. They're not involved in this. I'll, I'll disclaim it at the show that, look, this is, you know, if you guys like it, um, it's all a bunch of people that got together and told you what we did uh, 15 plus years ago. And if you don't like it, um, it's still us. Please don't get mad at EA either way. <laughs> they're, they're a great company and they're going to do an awesome job. Um, it's, it's just, this is the postmortem is all about us. Yeah. Surely the internet will be reasonable and understand that they shouldn't be mad at EA after yes, you so have that disclaimer. That's all you got to say. 
<laughs> of course, of course, the internet is always so understanding, and the trolls are always uh, really, really uh, very generous and kind. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what do, how much do you follow EA? Uh, maybe specifically like Command and Conquer. Every time it bubbles up with like the free to play version or the mobile version, do you have yeah. thoughts on that, or does it just feel completely disconnected from you? Um, I do have thoughts on that. Uh, as as you know, one of the founders of Westwood and being there during the whole time of Command and Conquer, and even being a consultant on some of the later Command and Conquers while I was still at EA. Uh, first, EA treated uh, myself and and the folks at Westwood very well. Uh, there were some unfortunate things that happened that were not really EA's fault, and so um, I'd be the first one to take blame for that. I don't think it's fair. Um, as far as the actual products that they've made, um, it's been hard to find that creative spark uh, to get the Tiberian series uh, back where it belongs. I think they did a very fine job with Command & Conquer 3, um, Mike Verdu and that team. There were an awful lot of um, Blizzard fans on that team, so it didn't quite have the the um, differentiation that Command & Conquer used to have. Uh, but I thought it was a fine game. And of course, all the Generals games, they did those as well. And they, I thought there was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, as far as the mobile game goes, and the most recent kind of um, vitriol, uh, I, I went into mobile games for quite some time, and I, and I quite enjoy making mobile games. I thought the game they made was very respectful to the series and was very in line with um, the thoughts and ideas around the series. They did take some liberties with some of the characters, which I think was fine. Um, and the way they approached that audience, I thought was also really good. I think the reason people were upset is they were they don't want to see a mobile game done instead of or in lieu of another Command and Conquer, you know, kind of uh, uh, homage to the series in the PC RTS. But I, but I would really encourage people listening to this podcast and, and fans in general to be a little bit more gracious, a little bit more generous. The way that franchises grow and, and thrive is when you're able to um, use them across multiple forms, whether it's toys, um, you know, television series, um, other mediums like mobile. Uh, and, you know, as long as it's respectful and it's not something that feels kind of shoddy in quality, I mean, I think that game was very high quality, the Rivals game, uh, I think is what it's called. But uh, I thought it was very high quality for a mobile game, and it had some neat ideas that were very innovative. So, no, I'm not upset at them at all, and I think that um, it's very cool. And I'm super excited about what uh, Petroglyph's going to do uh, with EA. Um, you know, I'm not part of that development, so I'm not disclosed, so I don't have m many details much than anybody else does. But, uh, but um, I just trust that they're going to do a wonderful job. It, it's kind of a bummer as an RTS fan just to think about hey, it looks like the future of the RTS genre is going to be remakes. Uh, I mean, every once in a while, some indie thing will pop out. Um, but do you just see that as like, well, that's just business. I mean, you're, you're a businessman at this point. I mean, what would you do? Uh, do you think there's any money to be made for a corporation in making RTS games? Um, I don't. Yeah, I think that, I think that the, the genre is still very possibly a great genre to put a more mass market product. In fact, the sophistication and complexity of having to manage multiple things while doing action, uh, that was actually the thing that everybody said couldn't be done. They said, you can't make, well, it goes all the way back to Eye of the Beholder when we did that. We said, we're going to make a real-time D&D game. They're like, that's not possible. D&D is about taking your time and deciding what you're going to do. And it's like, yeah, it could be, though. could be about having to make a decision under pressure. And that's kind of the real-time thing that Westwood was really famous for. So we brought that to strategy games and lots of strategy uh, aficionados were pretty pretty mad at us because we had done some games with SSI and other ones. And they were like, you know, you've you've watered it down. It's not as good as it used to be. The AI isn't as... It's like, hey, yeah, but you have to make a decision in milliseconds, not, you know, minutes. Um, so I think the same thing is you're seeing that in shooters now. I mean, Fortnite wasn't designed to have this complex building uh, as a shooter. It was designed to be a, a last one standing but defending a base that's why it's called Fortnite. right and for those who haven't played the original the original is actually really fun and cool it's just not the running gun 150 people last one standing game that it is now and yet you look at the sophistication of how the, you build while and people are just having a great time with it i think audiences are ready for more sophistication and more complexity and the entire moba genre is about rts focused around just a couple of units um, and some mobs that are more automated um, I think it's ripe for another revolution of some sort. Uh, don't know what that game looks like, but I bet <laughs> it happens. I, yeah. I bet we'll be talking about some new genre that's super exciting, just like MOBAs. Um, uh, and we're going to go, wow, of course, those all owe their, their roots to their, their family tree back to 
um, a bunch of crazy guys in Nevada that thought it was okay to make people think and act at the same time. Right. Yeah. Dota auto chess doesn't quite work, but it's close enough where you could trace the roots back, I guess, to the RTS genre. Um, yeah. So uh, this week, I don't know if you're clued into the internet, but you never guess. Uh, people are pissed at EA. Um, just oh, the whole... know, shocking, right? I know. So EA, it's just EA did... so honestly, EA... people are pissed at EA. You know. <laughs> Look, here's my shock face. <laughs> <laughs> So just the Anthem thing, right? Uh, Bioware releases Anthem after working on it for seven years, just uh, working their asses off on this thing. Finally gets out the door, and I feel like there are those rumblings of like, oh, God, if Anthem doesn't perform, you know EA. Just they're going to get out their scythe and just take the studio down. I mean, do you think there's too much made of the lore of EA just killing studios left and right as from a front row seat perspective with Westwood? I can speak to my personal experience. I mean, I have a, a lot of history at EA, um, you know, we we joined them in 92. I stayed until 2009. So I was there a long time. And I was creative director at the ALA studio. So I, I was involved in a lot of other products besides just Westwood products. Um, and, and the company is is no they're, no, they're not, they're not some evil giant that looks to de- destroy studios. It's not what it's like at all. But they're, they're business realities. And, um, you know, sometimes things run their course and, or, or companies just get to a point where the products that they're building are not as as viable as other ones. And you have to make some hard choices. Um, I now run studios and, you know, there's lots of games that I would love to make as uh, sort of uh, hobbies or science experiments. But at the end of the day, you have to invest in the things that you think are going to get a good return for the company. Um, And that's both for the benefit of the people that work there as well as the shareholders and others. And sometimes that means teams or products um, have to sunset. It's just, uh, it's just a normal course of the, of the business. Um, If people are really passionate about, uh, keeping uh, games like Anthem around and making sure, go buy them. Buy them and buy the online added products and make sure it's a viable business. That's what the consumer can do. If you like a product line, if you like a company, if you like a studio, um, support those products, support those things, even even competitive products. Um, you know, I, if, you're, if you have a free-to-play game and you never spend any money on it and, you know, maybe the business model is a little less aggressive than loot boxes or other things, uh, what you're really doing is telling the the publisher that doesn't work. Right. So, you know, buy those cosmetics and spend some money and put some time into it. If you like the product, invest in it. I know that sounds crazy. It does, but, but I hear you. It, that's what makes them succeed. I mean, Fortnite is successful with lots of cosmetics, and so that proves that that model works. Yeah. You're talking about, you know, knowing when to, you know, just to be practical, pragmatic, knowing when to kill a project and stuff. It, it reminds me of, like, your time working on Spielberg's LMNO project the first person yeah. story focus thing. Cause I've heard you talk about it in the past and it seems like, what was it just a couple years of development? How long was that thing in, in the pipeline? It feels like now was, that's the blink I, of I an eye. I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't probably speak to that because I, I was actually the ram the studio for a bit. So I actually have a lot of detail that is probably not uh, appropriate to disclose, but I would say that, um, you know, I can say that the product was running for a very long time. It was a big team. They were doing some really impressive stuff. Um, it was it was truly mind blowing how beautiful um, and, and how sophisticated the the approach was, uh, and and honestly, um, you know, I'm I'm partially responsible for that project being closed because I was very honest about the, the forecast. Uh, lots of other folks within the EA organization at the time were, like many developers, optimistic about what they were going to accomplish and how much time and money it was going to take. I was very realistic, and I said, look, I've worked with Stephen on the Boomblocks projects, and I can tell you what he's aspirationally wants to do. And this is really, this is epic. This stuff is incredible. Uh, It's going to cost a lot of money and it's going to take a long time. And here's how much money and here's how much time. And, you know, I was given some advice that says, you know, just say that you can get it done in the year. And if it doesn't work out, just ask for more money later. And I said, I'm just not going to do that. Uh, I'm not going to do that to the team. I'm not going to do that to the company. I'm going to be honest. And, And so, you know, we had an assessment around it the same way we did with so many projects in my life. And in this one, uh, they looked at all the different products they had, and I, 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 disappointed as I was that this one wasn't one that EA felt was the better investment, um, I understand that. It was a very reasonable and logical decision. I stand by the team's estimates. I stand by what we were trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, I think it was better to be honest and not have that product go forward than to continue to uh, run in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where people were promising things that couldn't possibly be delivered. Um, in timelines and dollar amounts that weren't 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 achievable. Yeah, uh, I'd rather see people take lot bigger uh, financial investments. Um, one of the things, one of the nice things about working uh, where I work now, we have we have very big budgets and we're willing to be very bold and take a very long view, which is great. And where do you work now? 
Oh, I, I run Amazon Game Studios in Seattle. There we yeah. go. Perfect. How are things going up there with that? Great, great. Yeah. I mean, our, our PR folks are very clear about this is a uh, classic uh, CNC interview, so I got to stay off of that topic, but <laughs> things are wonderful in Seattle and uh, I'm a big fan of Amazon in many, many ways. Okay. Interesting. How long have you been up there? Uh, two years. Okay. Awesome. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting, you think we're going to be seeing just more and more or things about to snowball for Amazon game announcements? Uh, yeah, we're, we're we're constantly putting out products, and you know we're we're humble and building the expertise that we're looking for. Uh, the teams are awesome. We've got great talent, and uh, like everything else, uh, it's got a long view, which I like a lot. As a game maker, um, I like being able to be honest and realistic about what it's going to cost and how long it's going to take and how many iterations it's going to take to get to success. And recognize that you know you may just get lucky and hit it out of the park the first time, but more than likely it's going to take many many efforts and many swings at bat before you get, uh, if nothing else, even the reputation where people are excited. Um, and I thought Apex was a great launch to show you know with reboot what the what they or respawn respawn uh, yeah, what they what they um, what you can do when you have a bit of a reputation um, and you just surprise somebody with a good game. Hmm, interesting, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Lou, but you've had a, a, a crazy impressive career. Uh, like walking through everybody that you've worked with and for so long, it's just absurd. I mean, you just Spielberg alone would be enough, but combine Spielberg with like the United States military, what, Hasbro, I guess, back with like Monopoly and stuff. Sure, with Monopoly, the Blade Runner partnership. Yeah, uh, of course, yeah. At Disney for The Lion King? Disney, D- Dungeons and Dragons. Um, we did a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons games. Uh, I've done multiple games with Disney actually over the years. Um, so yeah, licensed products a lot and a lot of original products as well. Some games that were had wonderful fan support, but maybe didn't quite get to the volumes we wanted. Yeah. Things like Renegade or Earth and Beyond. Um, well over a hundred games that I've made over the years. Um, and then I've done crazy stuff outside of the games industry as well. So uh, it's been a really long and wonderful career. And I'm just so Honestly, uh, just so thankful to have been able to live in a time where the world has been changing so much. And so I'm, I'm ADHD and uh, thank God for our industry where I can be a programmer and a designer and a finance guy and a business guy and do all these crazy things and actually be successful at all of them because the company is the companies and the times are growing and moving so fast. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've uh, really enjoyed it. And. Um, I'm not even close to done yet. I've got so many cool ideas. Uh, even even recently, you know, we did this cool game over at Kixai um, called War Commander, um, Rogue Assault, and it was just loads of fun to do a military-style strategy game on mobile devices. It was just we it was I was really proud of that game. Um, super happy with the way it came out. Um, it's morphed a bit as all games do with that are mobile, so it's not quite the same game as what we started. Yeah. But I was super happy with what we launched. Which uh, which era of your career do you think about the most? The one I'm in right now. Well, outside of that, I don't think about very much. (laughs) 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 But uh, no, not to be cheeky. Um, You know, I think the Westwood. There's two two uh, history points now that I really look back to: uh, Westwood and Shuffle Master. Um, And because uh, at Westwood I had such a heavy hand in the culture of the company um, and how we conduct our business and how we treated people, Uh, and uh, I love the fact that. at Amazon, the leadership principles and the code of conduct are so aligned with, uh, honestly, what we did naturally. Uh, and nothing's perfect. Uh, you know, there's certainly some people that, that uh, have less less favorable memories of the Westwood time, but it was definitely a great company that really pushed very hard, and we cared so much about the customer. Yeah. Um, and then master because. Uh, I, I was on the board of the company for six and a half years, and I stepped off the board to be the strategy officer to um, bring it into a different um, direction around kind of products it was doing. And this is the gambling industry, um, gambling supply. Uh, but it was great because we got to build something uh, on top of something that already existed and was working really well. So we got to go from good to great. And that was just an exciting time. And I worked with some of the best people in both of those. That It's always when I think back about what's the best parts of my career, it's always about the people that you worked with uh, and the products you made. Um, you, you really don't remember. I can't wrap my head and think a bit to remember the numbers and the finances and the units sold. I mean, sometimes you remember that because it's just validation that you had success. But I think the stuff that really comes back and resonates is about the people. And one of the questions I asked in the in the postmortem to each person I interviewed was, what was your favorite memory of Command & Conquer? And time and time again, it came back to, oh, it was just so great. We got a chance to play the game every day. We got a chance to contribute our ideas. 
Um, nothing was off the table. And because back then you had to build everything from scratch, we didn't inherit an engine. So nobody could complain about the game engine, right? We were writing everything. So if, uh, if it didn't exist, it could exist as long as we had the will to bring it into, into existence. Yeah, that's awesome. When I brought up uh, with coworkers, I was going to be interviewing you. Uh, I said, like, hey, does anybody have any questions? And multiple people, the first thing they wanted to know is, why the f*** was that Lion King game so hard? <laughs> well, there's a real answer there. Please. Uh, I know we're kind of off topic here. Uh, Disney uh, had been doing some research on rentals at Blockbuster. So, th- so for those folks listening to this podcast that are not quite as uh, long in the tooth as myself, um, people used to go and rent video games. Uh, this was a thing. Uh-huh. And um, if they rented it and they took it home and they got too far in the game, Disney's analytics showed that uh, they wouldn't buy the game. And so it was critically important to Disney that uh, they not get more than a certain percentage of the game before one night's rental, which was, I think, uh, they estimated six hours or eight hours of play. The problem was is this came in very, very late. Um, we only had... Uh, from January to July to make the game to begin with from soup to nuts. So this came very late in the day and we didn't have a lot of flexibility on how to make, how we could scale the difficulty. We made the argument that because the game is two games, um, you have the the young cub and the the adult lion, that once you switch to the adult lion, all we had to do is make sure that you got a chance to taste that and that would be a better place. But that's halfway through the game. Right. That was too far in their mind. So we had to make one of the early levels difficult. And the only one to do it easily was to expand the monkeys on the uh, can't wait to be king level. Yeah. So much to the, to the chagrin and re, you know absolute protest of Seth Mendelson, who was the lead designer, um, and basically everybody on the team, we added a big section of this monkey puzzle and just kept making it harder till it tested to the level that was necessary. Um, but if you get past the monkey puzzle and just go Google it, it'll tell you how to get past it. Uh, the game the game does not ramp up difficulty there. It has a natural ramp um, past that puzzle through all the way through the rest of the game. I cannot imagine being a game designer on that team and just being like, this is complete bullshit. Like, kids are going to buy this game. It doesn't need to crush their souls. Yes, yes. Oh, well, I, I got to say, Aladdin was very difficult, too. And at the time, platform games were very hard. And the guys who did Super Meat Boy really understood that. And they brought back that difficulty. I mean, Dark Souls, look at that. Another game. Freaking hard. So there was a time, again, for all the people who don't have the as much gray hair, uh, there was a time when video games were hard. They were actually hard. <laughs> there was none of this you can't fail thing, you know. Uh, and and what happened, of course, is over time, uh, challenge and, and that sense of achievement um, was replaced with a sense of progress and progression, and you just added more content. Games just got bigger and deeper and longer, and so you could make them a lot easier as people would still get enough entertainment value to feel like it was a good um, a good use of their time and money. So that's what really replaced difficulty. It used to just be we didn't have the resources to make something that would give you 60 hours of gameplay if it was really easy. We would burn through it too fast. So we just had to make games harder. And and I go back, some of our games were just freaking hard. All of them were. Um, Drag- Dragon Strike was hard. It was, uh, I've gone back and played it again. Man, that game was hard. Um, you know, even Monopoly, we made that game uh, with the AI. The AI was, yeah, AI was brutal. It was very <laughs> good at Monopoly. Fact, uh, yes, that's how it is. Old. 10 years old and he used to play it all the time and he went to my mom and played the board game with her and beat her repeatedly and she said how do you play that game so she actually got the game to play it as well so <laughs> i'm amazed that you guys how many months did it take to make lion king uh well we got the contract uh we got the deal in principle in november of 2000 of, of 93 we got the first drop of assets and the story in february of 94 by May of 90, April, uh, April, yeah, April of 94, early May, um, we realized that their only way we were going to get this game done was to go to Disney because we were getting dribs of information. They just wouldn't send us anything. So we flew out to Florida and um, I was there for uh, 23 days or 26 days in Florida and then brought the team, the core team out there. It was only uh, 13 people at Westwood um, that made both the SNES and Genesis versions. And then we had a team at Disney Studios under Patrick Gilmore's that helped with a lot of the artwork and really saved us. Um, they, they helped get the quality bar up there because uh, we were just scrambling to get everything done. They really held, held a high bar. And they also helped with some of the volume of work. So hats off to those guys. They, they often don't get mentioned and it's important. They were a big contributing part. We had to finish the game by July and gold master it. Um, basically, they weren't called gold masters. They were just uh, master proms at the time. 
Uh, and I remember, you know, a lot of people would say, well, there were quite a few bugs in it. We had some problems and there definitely wasn't as clean as we would have, we would have liked. Uh, but I remember sending the masters out to both Nintendo and Genesis. And I said, look, this is the day, the last day that you can pack it into your boxes. It's all your manufacturing deadlines. If you don't want to approve it, that's cool. We're going to keep working on it. Um, but we'll miss the, we'll miss the pack in. And it was, it was so commercially important that the game be packed in that we, uh, we did ship it with some known issues that I would have loved to address. Yeah. Um, not the least of which was the difficulty that we would have we would have loved to have more time to make a more convincing argument, do more studies. We just didn't have time. Totally. I'm just amazed. Even when people make like throwback style games, like it somehow takes or it can take years, you know, to if somebody yeah, I mean, made like a throwback I, I, Lion I, King game. Yeah, I'm always surprised at how long it does take at times to get the core idea down. Um, when I started in the game industry, I tried to make a game a month. And I was more or less okay at doing that. Um, sometimes I was just I was a little lazy and didn't get one out. Um, but I would submit them into magazines, and they would get published. One out of three or one out of four would get published. And these were very simple games like Surround, you know, like the little snake that goes around. Um, one of them I did was uh, was um, Squirm was that one. Uh, gosh, I can't think of the name of this one now. But it was a a 3D one. Um, using character graphics, and that became the 3D system that was used for all the gold box games in D&D. Uh, so there was like these really quick little ideas that you would come up with and go, oh, I've got this cool idea, and you'd quickly prototype it up. But you got to remember, you had to write everything from scratch, I and mean, there was no game engine. Yeah. So nowadays, it's really cool. I mean, you write out of the box, you can take something like Epic's Unreal, and you can have a game up and running in a few, in a, in a weekend, in, in a few weeks, and have something actually you can touch and play. The problem nowadays, though, is to get that to quality, to the level that the gamers expect now, is just a lot of work. And it takes experts. And so that's the problem, is it's difficult to, it's not hard to get something running. It's very hard to get something at the level of quality. Uh, it's just not, you can't just take the shoot pack, the shooter pack and run around and say, oh, good enough. It's just not good enough. Yeah, it's part of it too, just back in the day, it's like, well, that staff must have been so excited about working on a game like The Lion King. And so it's like, all right, we'll just uh, self-impose crunch just because it's fun. Like how important do you think self-imposed crunch was back then to just games getting cranked out oh, so fast? Oh, I think self-imposed crunch, if that's what you want to call it. I think dedication to your craft um, and putting in a, a really extraordinary effort uh, is as important today as it has always been. Uh, and, I, and I think it's poor uh, business management to schedule beyond a reasonable work day uh, because that burns people out and um, it's an unsustainable and untenable thing. It makes people unhappy, but it's always important to have stretch goals and have uh, the team excited and, and, and clear about the things you can do more than a standard workday. And um, the people who really care about their craft and want to do a good job will put in the time. And that's, that's the best kind of overtime because you're just thrilled. And at Westwood, when we were building Command and Conquer, the entire studio would sit around after hours and play the game for hours. Yeah. I remember on some of the other projects going, hey, really, we need to turn off the playtest because we're not going to ship Monopoly. I mean, literally, Monopoly was shipped at the same time as Command and Conquer, both shipped in the fall of 95. Um, and those were, it was not an easy project to get Monopoly done. We added animated sequences for every one of the properties. And these, I mean, we just a lot of work. We put a lot of work into a board game. The AI itself, uh, Mike Rayford and Mike Leg did a bunch of work on it. It was hard. And so, you know, while we're sitting there playing the game all night, we're playing Command and Conquer all night. I was, I was there with them. <laughs> You're also going, well, we got to get this, we got to get this stuff done too. We got these other projects we got to do. But that's the, when you see that happening, and even now in my studio, um, you know, we've we've had some weekends and stuff where I go into the office and I'm just going there to play. I might be playing uh, New World or one of the other games that we have because they just take a lot of time, and uh, and I see all these people working. And they, I know they're there for the love of it. They love the game. They love. They're doing the best they they possibly can. Um, we're literally wa launching an episode of uh, the Grand Tour every single week now, um, and it's really a fun, exciting thing. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Do you feel obligated though to let people know, like, hey, feel free to go home, everybody, just because I'm oh, yeah, here seeing I, you like late. I said, like it's, it, there's there's times where you have production realities where you might have to ask somebody, and it's really important that you give them time back somewhere else in their life so that there's a balance. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, games have always been my hobby. So when people talk about my work life balance, it's like. Uh, I know I will have to do some things I don't like to do every day. That's why they call it work. But at least if every day I do something I really love to do, I feel like I've, I've achieved my balance. And um, I don't perceive it as being addicted to work. I perceive it as being addicted to being a creator and being addicted to having this um, in incredible uh, 
I mean, honestly, this 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 great fortune to be able to build things and to be able to work with experts in their crafts. Um, I just find it super exciting, and I see it in every team. I know a world class team when I see it because they all put in so much effort and they care so much, and they'll push back hard if somebody tries to schedule them too much because they know that they need that time to get to high quality as well. Yeah, for sure. Well, with the remake of Lion King, Lion King uh, coming out this year. If you had to make a new Lion King game, what would you go for? Okay, you, you'd get rid of the bugs and stuff like that, uh, but <laughs> would you change the genre? What's your vision for a Lion King remake game? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know anything about that. Somebody else mentioned that to me. I have no idea what they're doing. So I guess the first question I would ask is, is am I remaking the Lion King platformer? Because if so, then I know what I would do. Um, I have very strong ideas about that. If I was just going to make a game about Lion King, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think I think that there could be a third uh, person. You, you have a character. The whole thing is, a, is Simba's journey. It's a it's a rite of passage or a journey of passage. So, um, I think it would be critically important to have Simba on the screen. Like I certainly wouldn't do point of view for that. So I would definitely go third third person or third character. Uh, and I think you could make an action adventure game that could be really exciting and fun. And you could bring the savanna to life. Um, there could be some fun things you could do with around. Um, playing playing lion games. Uh, one of the things working on the game while they were working on the film, which was so neat, was all the research that the animators did on real lions and what they do. And if you look at the prides in in Africa, um, the lions, the, especially the young uh, female lions, they do a lot of uh, essentially games that teach them how to hunt and 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 such. And so I think it could be really fun to build up your the skill of the ability that you're going to need to use as a lion doing that. So I could see it being a, a super fun thing. Um, if you were doing the platformer, then of course you're going to do the butt bounce thing, but I would, I, I would the pounce, but I think for the, uh, for the total you know, clean slate, I would go for third person. Because I actually have no idea what they're doing too. So I could be way off on what they decided. Wait, on what, uh, who decided? You said a remake of Lion King or? Talk, oh yeah. You... Remake for the, for the film that's coming out this year. Oh, I thought you made a game. Somebody else mentioned a remake of the game. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So, oh, oh that'd, that'd be interesting. Okay, yeah, another film. You're talking about the live, uh, the, the, yeah, yeah, that's going to be kick ass. Sorry, I was way off on a tangent there because oh, I thought you were talking fine. about this. So, no, no that's but the awesome. film, I'm super excited to see. Um, and I, I mean, I, 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 again, I love the animators of Disney because they bring their craft to the digital realm. Um, and of course, uh, so much of Pixar's influence on all of that as well. So, uh, granted, they are very different studios. I worked with Disney Animation Studios as well as Pixar. Those right. are different companies. Um, but I'm I'm super excited about what they're going to do for the film. Uh, the, I saw that opening sequence and it, and it you know put a lump in my throat the same way the original did. Um, that's actually how I got to do Lion King. Was we were sitting at Virgin and uh, Martin said um, Martin Alper said. I've got a project I think you might be interested in. And he knew I love Disney. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, you know what? Uh, not really. Don't want to. We got so much stuff going on. He goes, you come and see the first five minutes. And if you see the first five minutes and you don't want to make the product, we're done and we're fine. And I'm, I'm like, ah, bastard. <laughs> 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 you know, of course I had to do it. Uh, so You yeah. should have just called his bluff. Just watch the <laughs> circle of life opening and be like, eh, <laughs> meh, I don't think this film's going to be a hit. We're good. And just walk out of yeah, there. Just see yeah, how they react. Yeah, there, of controversy at the time because uh, the former animal movie Disney had done was uh, Oliver and Company and it didn't work out well. And so there was a lot of risk associated with that. Who's going to go see an animal uh, an animal movie by Disney? Um, you know, they, they want princesses. Uh, and it's not even about a princess. It's actually about a prince that becomes king. So it's also a boy character, which was another, like, these were just like, oh, you can't do this. Uh, same thing with Blade Runner. I mean, when we did Blade Runner, they go, it's a 10 year old movie. It's a cult classic. Who's going to, how many people who care about Blade Runner play video games? It's like, there's going to be five people who buy this game. Um, <laughs> hopefully both cases, uh, the, the pundits were very, very wrong. Um, and I believe, I really believe strongly that if you have a franchise, it's incredibly important to lean into the franchise and do the product that the fans of that franchise really like. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. That that often works out really well. Worked out well for the Dungeons and Dragons games we did, for Lion King, for um, Blade Runner, and others. Um, and sometimes you may do something that 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 you're hoping that's going to blow out of that niche, and all you do is satisfy that niche. But from a from a business and a creative point of view, that's the risk worth taking, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. The the crazy thing about that Lion King. Oh, yeah, what's that? Intellectual property uh, deposits instead of withdrawals. It's very important that when you build a product around an intellectual property, the fan of that property feels enriched by having experienced that bit, whether it's a, a cap or a you know, piece of merchandise or whatever. 
you want those fans to feel like it was authentic and that it added to the value of the IP. And if you can hold your head high and say you did that, even if it doesn't have the greatest sales, I think you've done the right thing. Yeah, and fans of The Lion King were enriched because playing the game, they get to see characters and settings that were originally going to be in the film then were cut out, right? Yeah, 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 I think in the game as well as the, I don't know about the new movie, of course, probably not in the movie, I would imagine. Yeah. In the game, that was uh, something I'm able to talk about now, but, uh, you know, Disney's famous for when it's cut, it's cut. It's like they don't they don't recirculate the, the stuff that didn't make it. Uh, but the big sequences that were originally part of the, the there was big piece, pieces of the film that were cut because, um, you know, the the story wasn't well served. Once Simba decides to leave the, the Huda Matata um, Valley with uh, Pumbaa and Timon and he goes to the Pride Lands, that's, that's a decision that all this, this journey, that's where a lot of our game is uh, as a lion, as an adult lion. But that's because we need to have levels to teach you how to play it and also have some more context there, some big longer longer game uh, in the film it didn't do anything because there was the character doesn't change so the decision was to cut all that stuff so lots of that stuff was all this concept work that had never made it into the film so that that became the fodder for the game and it's so fun that that's our only glimpse now is this weird 16-bit version of like oh that monkey the animation looks great on him i wish i could see what it actually looks like from disney well you know and the disney animators did do the animation for the gorilla and all the other characters so when you see those characters those characters were animated by disney animators who worked on the film that's so awesome. So, That's so that cool. stuff didn't make it into the film, but they did the animation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you feel like the game industry in general um, gives enough credit to people like you who have seen so much and been here for so long? I mean, you must know so much. Do you feel like the industry uh, appropriately recognizes and honors and like has a place for you in the industry? Like, oh, right this way, oh, sir, God, please. Yes. Oh, God, yes. I, I, I mean, I, our fans are... Um, I am, I am oftentimes just humbled and shocked that uh, that they have any idea who I am. Uh, you know, we, we're we're an industry that's a little different than the music industry. When we went to Virgin, they treated us like rock stars, and they they really presented the artists very much like EA did in the early days. You know, um, but I think just like the postmortem we're doing for Command and Conquer, I think anybody who's going to be very genuine has to recognize that it's a team effort, and that even if you have a creative genius, that creative genius. Uh, is not going to be successful unless he has a team of people that are willing to buy into that that vision um, and and put in just their own heart and souls. And so I think the industry is very kind and very generous and extraordinarily um, supportive of individuals. Uh, when realistically, I think of all of the individuals out there who are truly honest, they would say it's it's not so much themselves, but it's the people they've associated with and the people they facilitate. Uh, I believe in service based leadership, and I believe in the best way to get best results is to make sure that the talented people that are building things have all of the um, restrictions and roadblocks removed as much as possible. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm very fortunate to be the face of and the the voice of so many games that I've worked on. Um, and but even games like Blade Runner, where I was the technical director, the art director, and the executive producer, um, I, still it could not have been done without David Leary, without Mike Legg, without Donnie Miele, without Joe Kukin. I mean, yeah, I mean, time it up, Aaron Powell. I mean, without those folks, there just couldn't have been. It wouldn't have been what it was. And so that's also why the postmortem for CNC is focused around the voices of the people who contributed. Um, they're the ones who made it magic. Uh, we we were there to make sure they were able to. Um, and Brett Brett is definitely the 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 one behind the vision, and you'll hear that in his video. Um, and working with Brett is is definitely uh, it's sometimes a challenge, but uh, but that's that's the personalities that are out there. Uh, I think I'm probably not quite as as hard driving as some of the other ones that have had success. Um, my style works for me. Their style works for them. I don't judge it. Yeah, sure. So uh, this GDC panel, is it going to be streamed? Is there going to be an archive? How can people watch it? Yeah, there will be. It'll be recorded. Okay. Um, there will be an archive. Uh, for all the people going to GDC, I really strongly suggest you go there in person because there there will be video pieces that are there, but there's also live interviews. Uh, and there will be actually some live events that I'm not going to give away that are worth going to. Uh, seriously worth the price of admission. So Okay, what a tease. Anything else you'd like to say, sir? No, just thank you very much for the time on the on the podcast here. And, uh, you know, I hope everybody comes to the show for GDC. Uh, I'm part of a team of, again, a team of people that work extremely hard to make a great educational event that's also just a lot of fun to go to. Uh, and I couldn't be prouder of my association with the Game Developers Conference over the past, I want to say it's 
16 or 17 years now. It's been a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm super proud to be a member of the board uh, and just very happy and humble to be in a game in an industry in the games industry where um, just a, a guy who likes to make fun things happen can can be treated like a, like a celebrity. Yeah, there we go, like a king. <laughs> Cool. All right. Godfather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. That was just a clip from a larger show called The Game Informer Show. You can find it on iTunes, Google Play, or GameInformer.com. We take the fun opportunities and exclusive information from Game Informer Magazine and boil it into a show that airs every Thursday with exclusive cover story information, developer interviews, a lot of fun stuff. So come love games with us. 